You have a random variable that is distributed according to a normal. You know the probability density function? Where does this normalization constant come from? Welcome to this video where we're going to derive this. Let us start by looking at why we need the normalization constant at all. For this, I'm going to draw something that looks like a normal distribution with an x on the x-axis, and it has the classical bell shape. And our function as given as the exponential of minus one over two sigma squared of x minus mu in bracket squared, because it is centered around a mu. If you were to do the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, so in essence, you would be looking at the area under the curve and you call this i, then you would figure out that this i is unequal to one. And this would violate the prob of a probability density distribution. So we need to divide by the area. So we have to introduce some sort of a one over i here in order to normalize our distribution. And this one over i apparently is this, but why is there a pi inside? Okay, let's start with the derivation. Okay, let's put this a little more formally. So i is the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity over this what we just had here, over the exponential of minus one over two sigma squared x minus mu in bracket squared dx. Now let us think a little bit about the distribution before we continue and assume I would shift this distribution to be centered around yeah, zero. So let's say to be make mu zero. And if I just shift this distribution alongside the x-axis, this wouldn't change our, our i, right? So the area under the curve stays the same. So let's say area stays the same. And this helps us to simplify the following on derivations and we can just ignore um, mu or make it zero. So in a sense, this would be equal to the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity over the exponential of minus one over two sigma squared x squared dx. And the classical strategy of integration is of course to find the antiderivative. But if you look at this function, then you will see there is no clear antiderivative for this function. And we can only solve this integral by a trick. And this trick works as following. Instead of thinking about the area under the curve itself, we want to evaluate the square of the area. So we want to evaluate i squared. And i squared is nothing else than, yeah, squaring the right hand side, which would be the integration, or multiplying it by itself. So we would get, make it more verbose, this is i times i. So we would get the integration from minus infinity to plus infinity over the exponential minus one over two sigma squared x squared dx times the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity over the exponential of minus one over two sigma squared x squared dx. And of course, this makes sense. You just evaluate the integral twice and then we multiply it with itself and then you get our i squared. But I can also propose something else to you. And now let us think two dimensional. So we have an x axis and we have a y axis. And in the x axis, I have a Gaussian again, which is centered around zero. And on the y axis, I also have a Gaussian that is centered around zero and it has the same variance. And if I do an integration over x, then I would get this area here. And if I do an integration over y or over the y function, then I would get this area. And this area is both the same. So in this case, it is i. And also in this case, it is i. Meaning that we can have yeah, two different integrals over two different coordinates, but with the same function. So we get i in, two, in both times, right? So we can just make one of the integral be over y instead of x. And if we do this, then we see that our integration can be put together. So the function here does not depend on y and the function here does not depend on x. And I mean, it would be 
more reasonable to evaluate them separately. But for the following trick, let's put them together. So the i squared is then nothing else as the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, then from minus infinity to plus infinity, so a double integration over the exponential of minus one over two sigma squared x squared times the exponential of minus one over two sigma squared y squared dx dy. And then we see we have some exponential rules here. So if we multiply exponentials with the same basis and they both have the Eulerian, the E basis, then we can just add up the exponents and we would get the double integration from minus infinity to plus infinity over the exponential of minus one over two sigma squared in brackets x squared plus y squared and then closing brackets dx dy. And we can also look at this visually. What is happening here? We have a double integration. So we integrate over an area to get a volume. And if we look at our two dimensional plot here, this would then in essence mean we are evaluating the three dimensional structure that is created by our two Gaussians. And I try to indicate here, my drawing is not the best, but it is kind of a rotational symmetric structure around this third axis here. And you could call it something like cone-like shape. I mean, it is not a cone because there is no, like, no sharp point here, but it's a bell shape in two dimensions. So I could call it just the bell shape in 2D. And so in essence, we would be doing an integration over this three-dimensional object and would be calculating the volume inside of it, right? But the good thing here is we see that we have the rotational symmetry. And that makes sense because in both cases, our sigma is the same. So the standard deviation is identical. So it is a truly rotational symmetric object. And whenever you hear rotational symmetry, you might think or you should think of polar coordinates because they are really good at evaluating rotationally symmetric objects in, yeah, in this two-dimensional integration. So we will shift our integration from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. And the transformation is given as r squared is x squared plus y squared. And phi is given as the arc tangent of y divided by x. But we see we don't even need the y, so I can put this in brackets, because we already see that here we have our r squared. Fantastic. So then let's do our change in integration. So we keep our double integration. I will adjust the limits later. Then we have the exponential of minus 1 over 2 sigma squared r squared. And the integration is now first over r and then over phi. Great. Then let's put in the limits of the integration. So here we integrated over the entire r square. So this is nothing else than the full r square or the full two dimensional space. And in order to um, capture the full two dimensional space in polar coordinates, we need to integrate r from zero to infinity. So from zero radius to infinity radius and phi has to be from zero to two pi in order to capture the full rotation around the circle. But whenever we do transformations, we should never forget about the transformation factor that arises in here due to the distortion of our differentials. And in the transformation from Cartesian to polar coordinates, this is an R. And now we find ourselves in a better position because we can find an antiderivative for this. Let's try. So there is an antiderivative in contrast to the integration in Cartesian coordinates. So let's solve the inner integration by keeping the outer integration. I mean, the order of integration in our case does not matter because the limits does not depend on each other, but still let's keep it like this. And let's find the inner antiderivative. And we evaluate this from zero to infinity as these are the limits. And we see, well, what do we have to do? So since we have an exponential, uh, the antiderivative and the, def like the derivative of the exponential is still the exponential. So we will keep this term anyways. And if we were to do a derivative of this term, so let's try to take the derivative of this 
and we would get something like, well, we would keep our exponential as this is the property of the exponential. And then we would get the inner derivative to be minus one over two sigma squared times two r. And since we have to get the exponential times r, this is already fine. And the two cancels with the two and we are left with minus one over sigma squared. And in order to cancel this, for the antiderivative, we have to multiply with the inverse of it, which would be minus sigma squared. And then we have our full antiderivative. Okay, let's evaluate the limits. So we keep our auto integration and then let's plug in the limits. The exponential of minus infinity or minus infinity squared is zero. So we have minus sigma squared times zero minus and then the lower limit so we plug in a zero, the exponential of zero or minus zero is one. So we get a minus sigma squared times one and then the integration over phi and minus minus is plus. So we have the integration from zero to two pi over sigma squared d phi. And since there is no phi inside here, we can just multiply with the length of the interval and then we're getting sigma squared two pi and we know that this is nothing else as i squared and we get sigma squared 2 pi here and so i is nothing else as the square root of sigma squared 2 pi and this is sigma square root 2 pi and that is the normalization constant. And recall this is the area under the curve of an unnormalized Gaussian so we divide by it in order to normalize it. Okay that's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Here you will see similar videos and you have the chance to subscribe to this awesome channel. See you next time.